you right now we just thank you for your word we thank you that we are just so just uh, stoked to be in your presence right now we ask Lord, that you just teach us much about your word father just fill us with your holy spirit because we just want to learn about you we want to grow in you and just be just uh just be here lord we love you and we praise you in jesus name amen as you know, chapter 2 of Hebrews, actually chapter 1, verse 5. Well, let me just start at the beginning. All of Hebrews is about how the Jewish people during that day and age, probably the early church of t days during the book of Acts, was heavily persecuted. And because they were heavily persecuted by the Jewish community, they, a lot of them wanted to go back to the way, to, to the, they wanted to go back to the, the Jewish things. They started to get that pull, that tug. You see it also in the book of Galatians, how they wanted to go back to the law. They wanted to go back to the sacrifices. And so the author of Hebrews just tells these guys, hey, don't do that. Don't do that. It's, don't stop drifting away from the, these things of faith and grace, the things of Jesus and the blood of Jesus and the sacrifice of Jesus. Don't do that. And so he just is telling them, don't go that direction. And the greatest way that he's trying to get them to stick with Jesus is just that he's emphasizing Jesus. He puts a spotlight on Jesus in the book of Hebrews. And he, especially how Jesus is greater than everything else. He's just the best. He's the greatest. He, he's number one. And so in, G, in uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 through 4, he says, Jesus is greater than the prophets. And he lays that out very clearly. And then in verse 5, chapter 1, verse 5, all the way to the end of chapter 2, verse 18, G, uh, the author of Hebrews is laying out how Jesus is greater than the angels. It's very in-depth. And, and, and in that whole teaching of how Jesus is greater than the angels, he lays out how, all these wonderful points about who Jesus is and what he does. I'll tell you, one of the greatest cures for our problems in life is that we just don't focus on Jesus enough. And that's what we need to be doing. Constantly looking at the Lord. Constantly focusing on him. Hopefully we're all doing that. And so here he is. Again, focusing on Jesus and this thing, telling the Jewish people who were kind of obsessed with angels and angelology, he goes, Jesus is greater than the angels. And then in this concept, and we're going to attack it more next week, next week we're going to see how Jesus is an aid for us as a human, dying for us as a human, the second person of the Trinity, God, eternal and everlasting, became a man born of a virgin, took on human flesh. Why did he do it? To save humanity. And he, he's really laying it out. Angels can't do that. But God did. And he did it in the person of Jesus Christ. She, he became flesh. He, Jesus for us. Now last week we looked at Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10 where God the Father saw that it was fitting and proper to save humanity for the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, to suffer and to taste death for us. And because of that, he became the captain of our salvation. Remember, we talked about how we are surrounded in our culture with a great amount of captains. You know, Captain Kirk, Captain Crunch, Captain, you know, whatever. Uh, we have all these captains, but Jesus is the captain of salvation. And he was made perfect through suffering. Not that he needed to become perfect. He just became the perfect sacrifice for us through suffering because he experienced it. He's God. He never experienced suffering before, but when he became a man, he did. And so it was laid out last week, and if you want to watch it on YouTube, feel free. But in verse 11, he goes on, he says, for both he who sanctifies, which is Jesus, and those who are being sanctified are all one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren saying, and then he quotes Psalms 22, 22, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. And again, he quotes 2 Samuel 22, verse 3, I will put my trust in him. And again, quoting Isaiah 8, 18, the author of Hebrews says, Here am I and the children whom God has given me. 
Now, what does this all mean? Well, verse 11, just check, check it out. It says, for both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. For which reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers or brethren or a relationship. He brings up this fact of how through Jesus Christ we are one. But before we get into that, we've got to look at this wonderful word called sanctification. Now, we know about salvation, right? I'm saved, salvation. And salvation is a great word, but Christian salvation, when you look at it in Scripture, is it really three distinct things. First, there's justification. Then there's something next called sanctification. And then lastly, there's glorification. Now, those are might be big syllable words, but what do they mean? Now, we have, to, we have to admit, we have to be honest. Without Jesus Christ, we're a bunch of sinners. That's all we are. We're just lost. We're dead in our trespasses of sins. The wages of sin is death. We're under the judgment of God, and we're literally dead men and women walking towards hell. That's horrible. <laughs> That's the bad news. That's who we are without Jesus Christ. But God loved the world so much that he sent his only begotten son to fix this. And how does he do it? Does Jesus come in and take us as we are and say, oh, you know what? It doesn't matter. I'll just forgive everybody. Carte blanche throughout the whole world. No. There's this thing called justification. It's the first part of salvation. We must be justified. What does that mean? Justified means just as if I had never sinned. The ticket to heaven, ladies and gentlemen, is simple. If you want to go to heaven, you got to be perfect. Now, I want to ask you, has, is anybody perfect in here without Jesus? <laughs> no way. <laughs> I'm horrible. <laughs> I'm horrible. Ask my wife. I'm horrible. I'm a, I'm a sinner. I, I, and, and man, I'll tell you, none of us are perfect. We can't get to heaven. We can't get to God. We can't have eternal life. We can't achieve anything in life without being born again, without being justified. We have to be sinless in the eyes of God. And you can't make yourself sinless. No matter how much I try to wash my soul or to balance out the bad deeds with the good deeds. I can't do it. It has to be a work of God. It has to be a miracle of God. I can't do it. You can't do it. None of us can. We're not saved by what we do, by our goodness. It's impossible. We have to go to God. We have to say, God, help us. And God sent his son to do this. What does it mean? How do we get justified? How do we become a Christian? How do we get saved? How do, does this sin get washed away? First of all, you got to recognize that you are a sinner. You got to admit it. You got to just recognize the fact I got a big problem that's going to lead to my death. I am a sinner. It's amazing how the brain works. The brain functions in such a way as to protect itself and protect you. One of the ways it does that is through a lot of different things. It gives you answers when it's not really the answer. It's just an amazing thing, the brain, how it works. Subconsciously, you, you even don't even have to try to do it. It just does it itself. And one of the things that it does, it is such a prideful little cuss. The brain just has an ego of its own. And because of that, it will tell you, you're good. It tells you mil multiple times, you're good. You know, like when you're having a, a tremendous heat exhaustion, you start to feel chilled because your body's telling you, you're good. You know, it's weird how the body reacts and the brain kicks in. And, and then this it does it spiritually too. We are in desperate need of a savior. We're covered in sin. And the, and the brain looks at us, the flesh, the brain says, yeah, 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 you're good. You're a good man. You're a good woman. You're a good person. And it covers for us. And when we get to a point, when we recognize our sinfulness, when we recognize our horrific 
life without Jesus, who we are. When you recognize that, that's the first step of recognizing that I need help. I can't do it myself. I'm a sinner. And then the other thing that you got to recognize is that there is a God that is greater than you, greater than me, greater than us. And we have to recognize that and say, oh, there's a holy God and I ain't holy. Oh, God. And we have this recognition. That's the first step. And then, secondly, then you got to believe. you got to have faith that there is a God and that he can do the work and you can't. Less faith in yourself and more and much faith in God. That he's the one that can wash our sins away, that can get us right with, with him. The next thing you got to do is confess. Confess your sins. Andrew, I don't think I have time enough to do that. I, it's such a great list. I hear you. I got a big one too. Costco size. I have many, many sins. But I'll tell you one thing. You got to confess them. You're like, do I have to list them one by one? Hey, you know, God knows all. If you want to be generic and say, Lord, here they all are. In this wonderful, horrible, not wonderful, horrible, dark, icky, bleh, basket of sin. Here you go, God. I confess them all to you. I clump them all together. Here it is. One big furball. One big bleh, to you, Lord. Confess them. He knows them. And if you have to address them by, by name, go for it. I've done that many a time. Lord, forgive me for my pride. Forgive me for my arrogance. Forgive me for this and that and the other. Oh, my flesh. And when you confess and you, 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 you confess and admit to God your sins, because he's holy, he's the way. And then you say, God, will you forgive me for these? Please forgive me. Forgive me, God. I... I, I that's all I got. I need your forgiveness. Oh, there you go. The Bible says that if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just for sure and will do. He will forgive you of all your sins and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Isn't that just grand? Isn't that just wonderful? That's what he does. And so you, you got to ask for that forgiveness. And then you repent. You know what repent means? You're going in a direction and you turn and you go the other way. You repent. You're living for yourself. Now I'm not. I'm living for the world. Now I'm not. I'm going to hell. Now I'm going to heaven. I'm, I'm switching directions. You got to repent of your sins. Ask for forgiveness. And then when you do that, at that moment in time when you make that happen, God's grace kicks in. His grace kicks in. Grace is givingness. It comes from his love. And then at that point when you admit, you recognize, admit, confess, and you believe and you ask for forgiveness, the God's grace comes in and he gives you, get this, he gives you his righteousness. His perfection. He covers you and washes you and covers you and clothes you, the Bible says, with his perfection and takes your sin and washes it away. He washes our sins away. He throws my sins as far as the east is from the west. He throws them into the deepest part of the ocean. They're gone. He for God chooses to forget our sins. Wow. And then he wraps us, clothes us in unrighteousness. Oh, and you know where else those sins go? They went upon Jesus at the cross. And God, because he's got to judge your sin, he judges Jesus. He poured out his wrath upon his only son instead of us. Wow! That's what he's done. It's, I like to call it the great switcheroo. We give him our sins. He takes our sins, washes us clean, and then clothes us with his righteousness. Jesus gives us his righteousness. We give him our sins. Grace. No, we don't deserve it. It's all of an act of love. And then after that, we then commit, surrender, 
submit to serve Jesus as our Lord, means Master, our King, and our God. I'm going to now live for Him. That's justification. That's what it means. That's what happens when you seriously say, Lord, I believe in you. And you're like, well, how fast does it happen? It's a prayer away. That's justification. It's a moment where you admit your sins, confess, repent, receive his grace, commit to him, believe in him. That's justification. If you have done that, you are justified, just as if you had never sinned. You are in that state. You're a child of God. You're part of the family. You're in. Have you done that? If you have not done that, that's what is needed to be born again. And he changes your life. He gives you a whole new life. Now with that new life, we go into the second part of salvation. It's called sanctification. Where we are becoming more like Jesus. Sanctification is for those who are born again. It's the lifestyle we live. Uh, we, we live. It's the lifestyle we live as a Christian. It's everything. If you're born again today, if you're a Christian, you are being sanctified right now. The word sanctified means to be set apart, to be made holy, brought in, uh, protected. You, that is what the Lord is doing with you right now. It's a lifestyle. Sa salvation isn't just once and done. Now you live it. Now you're changed. It, it's, a, it's set apart life. The, the sanctified life... Being set apart means that you're growing with the Lord. You're growing. You're maturing. You see this in the scriptures. We don't want to be babies in Christ forever. We want to grow in the Lord, right? We want to grow and mature in the Lord. And that's what it says in Ephesians 5.26. And this happens, this sanctified life happens through the word. John 17.17 17 talks about this. How the word of God grows us, nurtures us. And as we read the Bible, study the Bible, obey the Bible, and put it into practice, we are being sanctified by his word. And we are being set apart. Not just that, we're becoming like Jesus. See, this whole thing that we're living is called discipleship. We're becoming his disciples, his followers. The word there in the Hebrew is the word uh, talmudim, which means students. You and I are just his students, and we become like the master. We become like what we worship. So we are called in the sanctified life. As we grow, we are becoming more and more like Jesus. That's the hope. That's the prayer. Now, sometimes that doesn't happen. That's what was the problem in the church in Corinth. That's why Paul wrote him three letters saying, why aren't you growing, guys? And we're called to grow. They were saved, but they were not growing. We're called to progress, grow in the Lord, to walk with him, to keep going with him. And so we grow through God's word. We are becoming like Jesus. Next, we stay in that wonderful, we are also being washed and cared for, be made holy. And we were made holy at justification and we are continuing to be holy through the blood of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 10.10, 10, Hebrews 13.12 talks about this. It's not just a one and done. It's a continuing process of God's blood washing and cleansing us and keeping us in a good standing with God. It's not our blood, sweat, and tears. It's Jesus's. He's the one. And so he, it's through his blood. And then also the sanctified life, and I'm, I'm sorry to inform you, is an all-out war. And no one likes to hear that, but that's the sanctified life. It is a war, man. We have an enemy that hates us, that wants us back. The flesh rises up because the spirit now rules in our life and, it's, and, the, and it suppresses the fleshly desires that are, are just cursed. And that old man is buried and dead, but man, it still wants out. And man, there's a fight between the flesh and the spirit. Read Romans 6, 7. You'll see it. Paul talks about that fight. 
There's a war in the spirit. There's a war for, uh, against the world comes against us. Tempting us. That's what the enemy does. And the sanctified life is a battlefield. And we've got to fight in the spirit, in prayer, to live for him. The sanctified life also has a myriad of trials. Trials and tough times that occur because we live in a cursed world. Yeah, we live in a, we, we'll get trials. It's not, you know, a lot of people when they get saved, they think it's going to be just this, uh, you know, uh, you know, marshmallows and uh, care bears and uh, just, uh, you know, just like, hey, everything's swanky. No, it's a tough time at times. Now, trust me, the, you know, the Lord is great. He'll take us through it. It says he prepares a table for us in the midst of our enemies. The word table there is a banqueting table. You know, he sets up a soup plantation for us in the midst of our hardest trials. Praise God. That's great. He just sets us up. We are at peace with him in the worst of times. He takes us through. But there are trials and tough times. That's the sanctified life. We go through them. Persecutions, trials, tribulations. We go through those times in our life. And also, but the sanctified life, according to 2 Timothy 2.21 is a life of service. We're not just growing with the Lord. We're not just warring with God. We're also serving the Lord. We're his disciples. We work for him. We just serve him. We do everything for him. And then also, according to 1 Peter 1, 2, and Romans 15, 16, the sanctified life is a life that is spirit-filled. That's a spirit-filled walk. We do not live this life by the flesh, we do it in the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the sanctified life. Jesus is sanctifying you and I right now. It's just how it's happening. Making us holy, purifying us, making us like Jesus, setting us apart. In this life of sanctifying that Jesus has for us, he's sanctifying us. Look what it says in verse 11 again. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. What does that mean? Jesus, our sanctifier, and us, those who are being sanctified, get this, guys, are all of one. That means we're together in this. We're literally together. He's with us. Here is the molder, the potter, and we are the clay, and we're together on this. When I was at City College a long time ago, I had to take an art class. And I was like, man, I was just, I said, well, first of all, I don't want to take that art class where you had to see naked people, so I'm out of that. Made sure of that. I, was, I didn't want to throw up all over my, my, uh, uh, my pastels, you know? I was just like, Bleh. So I took a pottery class. Dude, it's so cool. What a mission field. I, got, I, I learned so much, and, and you were one with your clay. You were there, and you, you had this concept that you had in your mind, and you're, you're forming and molding that pottery. And it was a really cool mission field because everybody else was stuck at their wheels. They couldn't leave, so we just talked about, I, you know, when someone would say, you know, the Lord's name in vain. I was like, you, you know him? Let's talk about Jesus then, if you brought him up. And oh, they hated me. We always talked about the Lord. And we, I always, you know, we, they were talking about this. And I said, well, you know, Jesus says in the Bible, oh man, I think I got an A in that class just to get me out. <laughs> and it was a lot of fun though. And a lot of fruit happened to there. It was a lot of neat stuff the Lord laid out. But as I learned about the potter and the clay, they are one. They're there. And Jesus is the potter, we're the clay, and we're all one. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became sanctification for us. He's the sanctifier, and we are the sanctified. It is so nice to know that in this life of sanctification that is rough and tough, that Jesus is with us through every part of it. He doesn't abandon us. He even said that. He goes, I'm not going to leave you guys orphans. I'm not going to ditch you. Have you ever been ditched before? It's horrible. I remember when I was a teenager with my friends at Knott's Berry Farm. 
We got separated. I just say it's separated. I thought they ditched me. And I was by myself at Knott's Berry Farm. Have you ever experienced that before? Man, I was down. I was like, man, I'm by myself. You know how many funnel cakes I ate that day? Oh, it was depressing. I had blueberry, a, a, a boysenberry everywhere. And you know, you, you, get, you get abandoned by your friends. You get abandoned. You're all by yourself. But this is the thing, guys. This is the cool thing. Jesus won't abandon you. He's not going to leave you orphans. Every part of the sanctified life, the wars, the trials, the temptations, the flesh, the making us holy, the growth, the word, he's molding, he's molding us into his likeness, but he's present with us. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen? I mean, he's not far away. He's not abandoning us. He doesn't chuck us the instruction book, the Bible, and say, okay, figure it out on your own. <laughs> That'd be horrible. Figure it out. <laughs> Thank God deism is not true. You know, that he just wound up the clock and says, later. That's not true. And he does this, he is present, and he works through us by the work of the Holy Spirit. You can see this, if you want to, turn over to John 17. In John 17, verse 1... Jesus is praying in John 17, verse 1. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your... Now, Jesus is praying to the Father, and we get a glimpse into his prayer life. I mean, what a, an amazing prayer life. We get to see Jesus' prayer life in John 17. And he prays. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. That kind of sounds like verse 10, doesn't it? And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I have with you before the world was. Now skip ahead to verse 20. He says, I do not pray for these alone. He just got done praying for his disciples. But also for those who will believe in me through their word. He's talking about us. Here Jesus is praying for you and me, Christians. That they, that's me and you, all may be one. Oh, how we should be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, and that they may be made perfect in one. And that they, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. Wow. How great is that? He's praying that we're all one. This, that, that we who are saved, those who are given unto the Lord, us born againers, we're all one in Christ. All one. The unity we have in the midst of our sanctification is glorious. There's Jesus, there's the Father, there's the Holy Spirit, and there's the church. And you individually in that. Man, we have company. Because of Jesus Christ's work on the cross, you and I, the church, all born-again peoples, are one. Everyone who's justified, who are being sanctified, are one. Unity is the work of Jesus and we're already one. There's a lot of people that say, well, we got to be one. We got to be unified as a church. Guys, we already are. Well, it doesn't look like it. Oh, no, no, we are. That's the thing. We so often focus on denominations. We focus on groups. But the unifier of the body of Christ, the unifier is Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. It's not about being denominational or the same. Some people believe that we should get rid of all denominations and, and, we, and we all are the same thing. One of us, one of us. Become zombies. No, no, no. We are not that way. 
See, unity is not about us. It's about Jesus. Unity in the church is all about Jesus and his word. Because we are one and because of what Jesus did on the cross, his work, he's the head of the church. And the moment that we lose that, it, things fall apart. We lose our unity. And because we are one, let's act like it. How do we act like it? Love. Love. We got to love one another. That's what Jesus has taught us. Love God, love each other. We are called to love, and that's what we do as a unified body. And unity is broken in the body of Christ when the connection to Jesus is broken and the word stops becoming the foundation of our lives. If we're not living in, obe in obedience to God's word, if the word of God is not the foundation to our lives, get this, guys, we're not going to be one as a church. If we're not connected to Jesus as the head of the church, as the head of your life, if Jesus is not the head, the boss, the God, the master, the king of your life or my life, everything else is going to be jacked up. Unity does not happen. It's not going to happen. How do we stay unified? Well, you got to keep Jesus as the head. You don't, don't decapitate yourself. Don't do that. You know how you heard that expression? You know, he's cutting his nose off to spite his face. Well, stop cutting off the head of your life, which is Jesus Christ. Stay connected to the Lord. Stay connected to Jesus. Be in submission to him, one with him. If you're with the Lord Jesus Christ, guess what? You're going to, that's, that's unity. That's the first, you've got to be unified with him before you're unified with others. And then last, and then also nextly, uh, ne nextly is not a word, but nextly, I'm going to do it anyways. Jesus is the head and the word is the foundation. If you're taking notes, Jesus has to be the head. This is how we stay unified. Jesus is the head. Next, the word of God is our foundation. We have to obey God's word. We have to have that as the foundation, the building blocks of our whole life, the word of God. And then we, then thirdly, we must live in the power of the Holy Spirit. He empowers us. He's the one that gives us strength and ability to do all things through Christ who strengthens us. It's the Holy Spirit. And, and notice also that it says in the passage, um, all are of one, for which reason Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, is not ashamed to call them brethren. But he's not ashamed to call us brothers. In John 15, 15, Jesus says, No longer do I call you slaves, but I call you friends. But he says, I'm not ashamed to call you brothers. On one of the reels that popped up when I was wasting God's time yesterday, on the reels, on the little things that popped up, and I saw this cute thing where this sister went up to her brother to give him a hug, and the brother was like, <laughs> don't touch me. I don't trust you. And she kicked him away. She kicked him away. He kicked her away. And she goes, I just want to give you a, a hug. And the brother's like, I don't trust you at all. Get away from me, sister. And there was like an, a shame going on there. I, I'm not, you know, and you had, it was a cute little video. But the thing is, we get that way. You know, how many people here have a sibling that you're just like, geez, Louise, you know, I'm an only child. I have no clue. I, Kelly has two older brothers. And I, 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 that was my first introduction to si siblinghood. And I was just like, good, great, like really intimate with it. Watching them, how they acted at, and oh, I'll tell you, you know, Kelly will be the first one to, you know, they, they, there's a, a clash. I remember when we were dating, I was, I was talking about her brothers. I said, your brothers are such nice guys. I love your brothers. And she goes, they're dogs, Andrew. They're dogs. <laughs> I was like, geez, no, they're not. Like, they would torture me. And then I would hang out with my brother-in-laws, and they would go, oh, she was the worst. You're marrying Satan, you know? And they told me that. I was like, no. I was like, how dare you call my wife Satan? And he goes, so you'll find out later. I said, no, no, she's an angel. Not even a fallen angel. She's complete, wonderful, holy. But this is the thing. I was just shocked by that, dude. I was just like, my gosh. But here is Jesus, and when we become born again, we have this brotherhood with the Lord. 
And he's not ashamed to declare that we are his brothers in Christ. You're like, well, why can't you call us sisters, all you ladies out there? Because we are, a, we are the son of God. And so he brings us in. He says, hey, you're my brothers. You're my friends. We're in this. It's a family thing. And you know what they say about family? That family, that blood is thicker than water, right? Well, guess what? It's not by blood. We're con you know, we have this thing. You know, the, I'm a Cochrane. My blood, my DNA, my roots in the Midwest. Then you get the, that, that blood, you know, the family thing. And then you go, you know, my family's been in America since the, since the uh, 1600s. You know, we've been here for 400 years. The, our family, when we were colonial, we were those white evil colonials, you know. And, and we were, oh, you know, that's who we were. And, and then you go back farther and your blood screams out, you know, oh, yeah, I'm the English, the Vikings, ah, you know. <laughs> and you have that. And you have that, that, that DNA thing, that blood is thicker than water, that familial thing. You know, the, some of the worst fights that me and Kelly has ever had <laughs> is about family. Cochran's versus Stewart's. Which one's better? That was, now, that was back when we first got married. I mean, it was like on, you know, and man, we got into it. Sometimes it still comes up. And I just had to explain to her why my side of the family is better than her side of the family. Now, that's not wise because I'm a heavy sleeper and she'll beat me. No, I'm just joking. But this is the thing, dude. We get to, you get that pride, that ego up in the family. And blood is thicker than water. I had to take a psychology class in college. It was bleh. And, but there was a, my, the best part of psychology was a, a little comic strip in the, my textbook. And it was about this kid between his parents and he's looking at his mom and he says to his mother, who are you going to believe, mom? And he points to his dad. Me, your blood relation, or this stranger? <laughs> and I was like, man, that's pretty gnarly. Blood is thicker than water. But uh, remember, our connection as the family of God is a connection through the blood of Jesus Christ, not by our DNA. It's true f family. And how sweet is that? And so Jesus is, it's his blood. We're his, we're family. How great is that? He is proving that he, he's not ashamed to call his brothers. There's a love there. And so doing, we see something cool. How we are, and now, it, now he goes, he's going to prove this in the next two verses. And he says, saying, I will declare your name to my brother, and in the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. He quotes Psalms 22, verse 22, which is a messianic psalm. But he says, hey, now in, in quoting these, he's telling you how to live this sanctified life. He says, you're not alone. We already covered that. But here in Psalms 22, when he quotes this in verse 12, he says we're going to be called to, we're supposed to live it boldly. He, he says, I'm not, I will declare your name to my brethren. I will, he says, he's telling God, God, I'm going to tell my brothers about you. And Jesus declares the name of God to the world. He did that on the cross. Colossians talks about how he is the image of the invisible God. You see that in verse 26 of John 17. We didn't read far enough, but it's there. That he declares the Father. You see God in the Father. He declares him. And when he went to the cross, he, it was all about bringing the Father in connection to the world. He's bringing that way back. But he's not shamed to do it. And we're supposed to do the same thing. How are we supposed to live this sanctified life? Well, we live it in unity, but we also live it in boldness, declaring the name of God. Number three, look what he says. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. In verse 12, we are called to worship God. We're called to worship him. Jesus sings to the Father. He praises God. And as we are living this sanctified life, we're called to worship him as well. 
And in verse 13, it says, I will put my trust in him. He quotes 2 Samuel 22, 3. We're supposed to trust in God, have confidence because I have been convinced. See, trust here is where you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that Jesus is it. He's got you. I'm going to trust in Jesus. We are called to trust in God, in Jesus. That trust is a shield in 2 Samuel 22. Goodness is laid up for those who trust in the Lord, Psalms 31. Mercy surrounds those who trust in the Lord, Psalms 32. Psalms 125 says that if you trust in God, you shall not be moved. You'll be like Mount Zion. Proverbs 29, 25 says if you trust in God, you'll be protected. If you trust in God, according to Isaiah 26, 3, you're going to have perfect peace. Jeremiah 17, 7 says that if you trust in God, you're going to be blessed. And Nahum 1, 7 says if you trust in God, God's going to know who you are. You're going to be known by God. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7 that we live this life, this sanctified life, by faith, by trusting in Jesus Christ. And that word trust means you have been convinced fully and you trust. Then he quotes Isaiah 8, 18. He says, and again, here I am and the children whom God has given me. If you're going to live this sanctified life, you live it by faith. You live it boldly. You live it worshipfully, worshiping him. But you also live in availability. You live in an available lifestyle. When you're in being changed into the image of God, make yourself available to serve the Lord. Here I am, God. Use me. And he'll use you. Availability is a key to sanctified living. Here I am. And then lastly, it says, I and the children whom God has given me, remember as you're being changed, as you're being molded into the image of God, that you belong to God. You're the sheep of his pasture. Jesus has become a man, a human, put on flesh in order to properly sanctify us. So therefore, be that and, and also to be that example for us, as he molds us. And that's why the angels can't save us. They can't do this. Only Jesus can. I have a question before we close today. How are you doing in your life with Christ? Your sanctified life. How are your, how, how's your progress as a pilgrim? Are you unified? Are you being bold? Are you worshiping God as you're being sanctified? Are you trusting in him? Are you in the word? Are you serving him? Are you belonging to him? You can't do it without the Holy Spirit. My prayer is that God just keeps molding you and me. And we let him do it. And we have a desire for him to sanctify us. Maybe you've never asked the Lord. To, you, you've asked the Lord to save you, to justify you. But you never asked the Lord to grow you. Mold you keep you. That's all part of the sanctified life. Have you done that today? Well, you know what? Just like we have asked by faith to be born again, let's also ask by faith that he grows us, that he molds us into his image, and we mature in Jesus Christ through the trials, the tribulations, the war, the sufferings that we go through. See, because he suffered for us, and he has gone through it all for us. He loves us. Amen? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you so much for loving us, for caring for us. And we ask that right now, if there's anybody here in this room that they're born again, but they never really enjoyed the sanctif sanctified life. Lord, I pray right now that you would get a hold of those people. That we would just cry out to you, Lord, mold me. Lord, make me into your image right now. I want to be just like you. Help us, Lord, to be unified, worshipful of you, available to you, Lord. Thank you that you are not just the author and finisher of our salvation, but you're the keeper of our salvation as well. Thank you, Lord, for that. We just want to know you more, grow with you more, and love you more. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand, guys.
prayer this week is that you just grow in the Lord. You fall more in love with him more than you've ever done before. That you just get to know him more. And you just worship him and live for him. Because, I, you know, he's worthy of it all. Amen? Have a great rest of the week. And remember that after we get done worshiping the Lord, 15 minutes, fellowship, and we're going to gather on the front rows for prayer meeting. Okay? So if you want to join us, please do. Jesus loves you and I love you. And we'll see you later. Let's worship.